Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, so hello everyone for, for those who are joining us from different parts of the world, uh, the colonial subversions, friends and members. Uh, today we have, it's a very special uh, reading group event organized by Vincenzo Camarata as usual. But this one is different because we have a, uh, a special guest with us. And um, this is very much in line with our attempt also to try and bridge the more theoretical parts of the colonization themes with then um, the other side, the putting it into praxis. And this is it from me. I pass it over to Vincenzo, who has so kindly uh, brought this all together. Uh, hi, thank you, Monica, for uh, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to put this together. Um, uh, like you said already, this is a special occasion because uh, today we're going to discuss about decolonizing knowledge uh, with a special guest who's Dr. Fasa Loba, the chairman of the Sudanese community in Merseyside, is a physician in sexual health and HIV at the Royal Liverpool University Hospital, uh, Lido Stigma and BAME Committee, Liverpool Fast Track Cities, and has an extensive, uh, he's extensively involved in ethnic minorities work and research. So we have uh, a very knowledgeable guest who can uh, uh, give us some insights within uh, the Liverpool society and the Merseyside community as a whole. Uh, like uh, I said before, uh, introduced in um, my uh, emails to contact all the members of the, the colonial uh, subversions community. Uh, Liverpool takes up a marginal role in England because it's located in the Northwest and doesn't represent the majority of what Englishness is usually conceived. And so because we want to focus on minority communities within a minor reality like Liverpool, I pass the word to Dr. Fataloba uh, to give us some more information about the, the Sudanese community Merseyside and uh, give us some, share uh, some of his knowledge with us and uh, open a discussion around this. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Vincent and Monica, and I'm, I'm quite uh, privileged to be uh, invited to this uh, uh, meeting, and uh, and I feel uh, very, very special by calling me a special guest anyway. Um, yeah, um, well, I think I when I read about uh, the theme of the uh, conversation, I really get very much excited because I think these are the current issues that we need uh, to sit down and exchange ideas and 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 thoughts, uh, uh, especially in in a in a diverse manner, and in a platform like this one. Um, with regard to the Sudanese community to Liverpool, and I th I think we we all know probably you you experience that in sense yourself living in Liverpool. It is. It is a place that has rapidly changed uh, over the years, especially, I would say, in the last uh, 10 years or so, with an influx uh, of asylum seekers and refugees from all over the world uh, who come and, and continue to reside in Liverpool. And we have a, we have a, a very large uh, communities of uh, ethnic minorities uh, living in Liverpool. Um, and the Sudanese community is, is one of those. And it, it, it's a large uh, community. Uh, we don't have an updated uh, statistics of the number of uh, how many of them, but they are in, in their thousands. And, and we, we have a Sudanese community center, a kind of... Um, um, an, an organization that uh, been established long time ago, and it's kept going. And I am privileged uh, to uh, to chair the current committee. Um, and, um, and the aim of that uh, body is to uh, advance the lives of uh, all the Sudanese living in Liverpool. And they are actually, most of them are either um, 
seeking asylum or already being established uh, immigrants here by being granted refugee status and some of them being uh, neutral, neutralized as, uh, as uh, being recognized as British citizens already. So uh, it is a, it's a kind of a mix of uh, men and women and children. Um, so to work with them uh, is, 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 is a priority uh, for me personally, uh, because I think uh, they really need help and support and direction uh, to achieve their goals. Those, these people have come long way through very, very tough journey, life-threatening path to arrive to this country. And each one of them is carrying a dream. And, and it is just a dream, not necessarily based on reality, but it is a dream. Someone left their own countries and because of different reasons and because of the, the, their situation in, in their own uh, homelands and, and took all this journey and struggle to arrive here. And then to arrive here, they will have to really make, make sense and meaning of their uh, existence here. And for them to be able to do that, uh, it is really important to, uh, to create that dream in, in the first place. It is important for them to form a kind of objectives and plans. And we as a community, we are just trying to help him just to do that. Um, but the, the the way to that, uh, I think the there are different tools to achieve those, and 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 the major one obvious uh, tool to that is the language. You can't really, if you come to live in a country like this, you definitely need to learn the language, and learning the language uh, is 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 not as simple as it it sounds, um, and it 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 requires a lot of uh, determination and a lot of support and a lot of because there are so many barriers and so many issues around that we the the, the government uh, provides uh, a lot of courses and and training and and helping those individuals to learn the language whether that does that work or not is something else my simple answer to that no, it doesn't really work that much. Uh, I see all of them doing level one, level two, level three. I don't know what exactly that means, but they achieve all that, but they still, their language is very, very limited. And I am actually meant to invite um, a colleague of mine who just finished his PhD in, on the subject. He looked into the ESOL learners and he took the Sudanese community as the cohort that he studied. Um, and he looked at uh, the challenges uh, in, in, in the communication between the ESOL learners and the native speakers of the language. And he looked into all the strategies adopted by both parties because he studied two cohorts. Some are the ones who speak the language native, uh, the native uh, English speakers and the ESOL learners. And then he looked also into the, um, he looked into the strategies adopted by each one of them to be able to understand the others. And I had a few conversations with him and it, it sounded really extremely challenging. I work in the hospital and I see patients in clinics all the time. And you will be surprised that I see patients who stayed in this country for five, six, seven years, but and yet they need interpreters uh, to, to help them with the consultation. And I just can't understand that. And we, I, I have this conversation with each one of them because they all went to this ESOL courses, they've been living here. And, and they're still struggling in learning the language in a, in, a, in a standard that allows them to come to clinics independently and to express themselves 
and their concerns about their health and well-being. So that is in itself is, is an issue. If you can't do these basic things, when you speak about integration, I think th that is, I think that is a far cry. That is uh, a big ask, really. Um, so we, we started to think then, how do we get people to speak the language? What will be the best way to do that? And apparently there is no silver bullet for this. There are so many ways of doing this, but I mean, looking, I think the fairest thing to start with, which is the obvious thing, because there are resources going into ESOL policies, apparently, and, and these resources should really uh, give results, uh, good results. I don't know how these ESOL policies are evaluated. You're probably better than me to answer that question. But I think looking into this, I think I'm not too sure if there is any research in syllabus design, for example, because obviously um, our Sudanese cohort who's been into these courses, they did not come out as, you know, English speakers, or they have extremely basic level of English, not that much from the baseline when they arrive initially to this country. And given the fact that Sudan is, is an ex-colony and, 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 and most of our syllabuses are, we, we used to teach in English in our universities and even in some of our secondary school until probably late seventies and that has changed. But still, when I, went to, when I went to uni in Sudan, I studied in English. So, but yet when they come here, when all people from all walks of life come here, they, they speak really very limited English and they, and they struggle to improve that level. And that will create a massive barrier if you can't really speak, some of them are graduates, they're engineers and some of them are, the doctors have different pathway because they will have to go to all this rigorous evaluation and do the IELTS and do what and what. And doctors are completely different cohort, but I'm talking about the majority, which probably 90% of the individuals that we am seeing here in Liverpool. Um, the, most of them are university grads, but they end up doing really um, odd jobs. And that is the maximum they could do. They work in Amazon, they work in, uh, uh, in security jobs, they work in, in, in taxi drivers, deliveries, um, and they stay there without any effort of getting from this, which now become a comfort zone, which in itself is a real problem, is, is a real challenge. But then to do that, you really have to work hard towards that. And I have a couple of examples who broke that barrier and, and, and stepped out of this comfort zone and started to do things differently. And one of them is a person that he has just finished his PhD because I told him, well, you could really, I mean, there is no reason that you could just stay doing what you are doing as a security, there is, there is nothing wrong with any job in the world as long as it is a legal job and you earn money out of it and you support your family back home or your family here. But we are in a country that offers you opportunities and it's equal opportunities. If you work hard, you will get to wherever you want to get. And I, I myself, I consider myself as a prime example to that. I came and I, I work hard, obviously, and uh, I got all the degrees that I that qualified me to to uh, a, a role that I am playing in 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 an institution. So um, so this is this is one thing. So and I asked my friend who did this research. So what what is the problem? What what is the problem? Why is, why Sudanese ESOL learners can't really find difficulty in communicating with the um, with the uh, native speakers? And he specifically said that first of all they have very limited vocabulary size, and that is understandable, of course. Then the variation of accents that is another issue that poses 
a lot of difficulties for them because they just, you, and, and you, you mentioned there are Irish and there are uh, West Indi Indians and there are different who, who resided here for years and years. And then other than that, the, the regional dialects variation, which is, again, it poses the kind of, and some of them will complain they people speak too fast. And this is perceived speech rate is another issue because they will just tell you, okay, you speak too fast. I just can't get that. So the, these are the challenges that he mentioned specifically of the challenges that everybody here facing when they speak or communicate with their, with their uh, uh, counterparts. Um, but then if you have problems, you need to address it. <laughs> if you can't understand your neighbor or if you can't really talk to somebody at work or a colleague, you can't mingle with them at a social level and you can't, you know, and, 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 and talking, and we are just talking now about the language, but there are a lot of other barriers that I personally know when, if you look at, into Liverpool, Liverpool is unique in many, in many ways. And one of the uniqueness of Liverpool, most of the immigrants in Liverpool are living probably in a very specific area in the city. So if you go to, so like L8 area, this is a kind of uh, like, a, 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 it, it is an area as if it is a country within another country. And that is not unique only for Liverpool. It is elsewhere, you could see that. Because people, uh, the, the mosque, mosques are there, there are three or four mosques in that area. There are uh, halal meat shops, groceries, and there are, they meet each other. This, that was that they created their own comfort zone. They are there. And these are and they, and these are the places where they can practice their cultural practices. They come from communities with very strong cultural norms, and they stick to it. And then, of course, the religious beliefs, which is another <laughs> another strong thing. Religion is 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 extremely instrumental in in shaping uh, people's lives and. And, and it is essential in the way that uh, people actually stick to it and using it. It is part of the culture and most of us inherited some kind of religion without revising it. And, 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 and a lot of people don't revise their, uh, what they inherited from their parents, for example, if, uh, if uh, you are born Muslim or Jew or whatever, that, that, that's how, how you are. You don't really question that much. A few people do, but most of the people just stick to that. And that gives them a kind of security as well and, and comfort. And then, of course, the language. So they feel more comfortable speaking Arabic with a lot of people living in that area. So that is, that is one thing which is very clear. So I think when we come to integration, Integration is always two ways. It's, you, you need to integrate in the community, but the community should also welcome you as, uh, as, as, uh, as somebody who, who came to, uh, to, 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 to reside with them. But um, it, it's, it's never as simple as that. It's just because um, it's not only cultural practices and religious belief and language. It, it is, there is a lot of psychological barriers within that as well. I mean, and, and, and people, and of course, we can't talk about these issues without um, outside the context of economic mobilization uh, and, and social inclusion. These are the, these are the issues, the, the overall issues where uh, if you want to create a, a, a community where all the individuals in that community speak to each other and trust each other. That is, that's a different thing. But again, um, it, the, these communities are probably 
more isolated than you that most people think. They are isolated. They, they, and 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 to be honest with you, my experience, we have been speaking about the political situation in Sudan, for example, and people are talking about uh, forming a government of technocrats and bringing people who are PhDs from Oxford and Cambridge and who lived here for some time to come and lead the country and do all the. But my view was. Um, and now I spoke about the immigrants, but now let me just talk a little bit about all the professionals. We as Sudanese, uh, we are, there are a lot of us who are doctors, who are university professors, etc. But are we really integrated in this society? We don't have issues socioeconomically, we are okay. Um, we speak the language. But are we integrated? My answer and my quick answer to that is no. Most of my colleagues from Sudan, they don't have British friends, for example. They don't know their neighbors. They, they talk to their colleagues and uh, in the workplace, and but that's it. They probably don't attend Christmas parties or any, uh, uh, you know. And, and I, have, I, have, I have observed this over the years. And it is a fact. So what's going on here? There must be a they must be an issue. So if you bring a technocrat from here to lead the country, they are not going to have any massive impact because they did not adopt any new cultures. They are not coming with new way of thinking. These are guys who understand very well in physics and and economy and but that's not enough. If you really want. To, uh, to build a nation like the way in Sudan, you should have learned other things, not only the academic ones. And, and, that, is, and that is a real issue. And I think um, my personal experience, if you want to integrate, you can always do that. Um, the, I live in a place in Liverpool I know all my neighbors. They know me as well. We greet each other, we, we speak, we, we, we do different things. They would uh, congratulate me when uh, the Eid come, I perceive to be a Muslim and, and um, I do the same for them in Christmas and, and everything. But that is me and that is, uh, I'm not a representative of anybody at all. And I'm not cannot be taken as a representative of the other individuals in this uh, community. But my experience can be learned from because this is if I can do it, everybody else can do it. I don't have any special talents to make me able to integrate and to know other people and 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 to really care for them. And being a doctor, if somebody is sick, they would ask me, uh, "What do you think?" If I so it it, it is. It is, um, it, it, it is possible, but then we come back to the, if you don't know the language, you don't have enough confidence to do anything else. And that's a problem. If you can't speak the language, then your confidence is very limited. Now you invited someone from the Sudanese community to come to speak to you. And um, most of my colleagues who are leading the Sudanese community center now, uh, they, they speak very limited English, unfortunately. And um, I will have to be the one to come and talk to you guys because, because of that. Although they carry probably more brilliant ideas than the ones that I am trying to explain now. But the language barrier will not allow them to express that. Um, and I think um, reflecting on all this, I think we can still do things. You know, we did we did a research last two years ago, just before COVID, I think three years ago. To we just needed to know why people from ethnic minorities do not access sexual and reproductive health services like other people. 
I, I don't think they don't have need for that. There is need for that. And I know because I see them in my clinics. But why they don't access it? Why the uptake of HIV testing is very low among this, among them? While we know, for example, we know if you are bl from black, the black ethnic my, minorities in UK, they have higher rate of HIV infection and they present late to the service. It's always late diagnosis and that's not good enough. So we needed them to come as early as possible to get tested. Because if you get tested, you will get treated and you live with HIV like, like anybody else. Uh, HIV is not uh, uh, a death sentence as it used to be. So we carried out a research just in, in Liverpool, just to see what are the barriers? Why, why people don't come to, do, uh, to take the HIV test? And why they don't come to the services that are uh, available? Um, and it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, there are different uh, justifications of why that, that didn't happen. It's just because, again, the language barrier, again, and the, uh, the stigma and the cultural norms. If I see a man from an ethnic minority group who's a gay, uh, he will probably be very uncomfortable uh, for anybody else to know about his, his or his status or her status. And it's just because the stigma in these communities is so strong and massive and broad and deep. It's very hard to deal with it. In my intro, you introduce me as somebody who is leading a, a stigma and BAME community in, in, in Liverpool Fast Track City. And Liverpool Fast Track, Fast Track City is, is a global initiative around the world. And, and it is all about, uh, it is led usually by the mayor of that city. There are so many cities around the world uh, and some UN agencies, they get together and, um, and, and the work is to reduce the HIV infection and the late diagnosis and people who are on treatment, they have detect. It, they have very specific objectives. So Liverpool joined this initiative in 2018 and there are subcommittees. Uh, I've been assigned to lead uh, on the uh, subcommittee of uh, black and ethnic minority groups and stigma. And stigma is something very challenging. It is, I, I have no idea. I, I wear I work quite a lot around, in many countries around the world. Uh, and I work for the United Nations in Africa. And, and well, I, I'm a clinician, but I did a lot of work uh, at the public health level and a lot of activism. Um, and we fought everybody to uh, for the rights of people living with HIV AIDS when there was nothing and they die without any dignity. But if you ask me now, what is the best way to reduce the stigma? I have no answer to that. It's so difficult and challenging. It's just like how, how we get immigrants to learn good English and how we get them to integrate in the society. These are massive challenges. And unless we really have realistic conversation about it, and unless we work very hard and we get people who can, make, can be agents of change and, and people who will act as an intermediate level between the formal sector and the community at large and the ethnic minority groups. I go and give talks to the, uh, to, 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 to the communities and to my cohorts and they do trust me, they do listen to me. And, uh, but if this talk is given by probably anyone of different you know, ethnicity, they might not take it as, serious as should be. That's not right, of course, but it works. We need to create those bridges between, for especially in health service, we need to create bridges and trust between the communities and the formal sector and, and the corona, uh, 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 the, the, uh, and the COVID uh, e epidemic has been a very good example to that you could see a lot of people from ethnic minority groups struggled a lot 
from COVID. And death rate is disproportionate. And then the uptake of the vaccine. And that kept, kept me personally very busy working day and night to try to get the message across to people. This vaccine is useful, please take it. That has been very challenging, it's not easy. But the people like myself, who's been in the formal sector operating at this level, and at the same time working in the communities are very much needed to make that change happen. And that will be the gateway probably for any integration in the future. And I think, uh, I don't want to speak much more than that. And I, I just um, uh, uh, listen to your comments more than uh, I, I speak more. Thank you. Right, Monica, would you like to say something about this? Would you like to express some comments about what's been mentioned? Yeah, no, first of all, thank you so much uh, for this great, in detail, um, overview of the different layers of, um, of marginalization, of the different barriers that, that, that there are to the, to the integration of a community that was really not only eye-opening and enlightening, but it was just very, you ran us through this in, 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 a, in a really clear way. And there were elements here and there that I could relate to from my experience in India, for example, where, um, so I used to live in Hyderabad, which is a very big metropolis in the South. And it's also one of these hubs where migrants from all over India come. And uh, in India, as you probably know, there are so many different languages, different communities, different um, yeah, people from different walks of life who come to Hyderabad, the, where there is the, also the largest bus station of Asia. Um, so in a way, I, I drew some parallels to what you have um said about different people coming with their dreams with their aspirations and so but then there are very real challenges starting from the moment they get off this bus you know because they don't speak the language they are outside of their network of family connections friend connect friendship connections and so yeah this is it, these are problems that um really challenging I guess um, and to have this sophisticated viewpoint that you have given us from the different aspects is probably the first step to to look into something that is more comprehensive more holistic than just offering a simple language course because there is as we also see in the colonial subversions and so very often where we work with different languages a language is not just uh, putting words together. Yeah, you need to be within that network. You need to have something also where you can relate to the to to the people that is beyond these words. So, yeah, what does one do then? It's about also translating different cosmologies, different rituals, different. Yeah, there is the religion. So, I just would like to express my gratitude for having provided such a very holistic um, understanding pr presentation of your experience and and thank you so much also for sharing the insights from uh, your work as a doctor working in such a uh, sensitive field as well um, yeah just just to build upon this example from Hyderabad which I uh, had brought up mm, there is also one um, at the station. There is also there are a few people who are uh, volunteering. They they go and when they see that somebody is in distress or somebody who is very disoriented because of the language, yeah, these are, they are migrants from other parts of India. Um, they are being brought often to like a, a hospital um, where they are being checked if they need something and so so there is a first moment of uh welcoming but what happens next 
right? I think this is always something also that um, it's not done with a language course. It's not just done with uh, medical treatment. It's really about also something much more long term that maybe like recreating certain networks, but not only within the community, because then there can be the issue that you have highlighted of um, the Sudanese community, for example, having uh, being closely knit within itself, but maybe having a difficulty then accessing um, locals who have been um, natives, yeah. So I don't know, thank you so much for raising so many questions in such a articulate manner and bringing in your own experience as well. Thank you so much. It's, it's really eye-opening, thank you. So yeah, I join Monica in thanking you for uh, this contribution. And yeah, uh, loads of questions that are important to discuss that are the, quite nearly not impossible, but very difficult to answer. And the answers are not, like you said, are not like uh, the answers, but they're just, they can just be some ideas that can build something bigger in the future if we actually tackle the problem. One thing I can add to this conversation is my small, very small personal experience as a NISL tutor. I started last year and I've uh, had the opportunity to deal with different communities within the Merseyside area. I uh, worked in, a co in college and I worked uh, in the learning center and also privately. And I also had the opportunity to run uh, this very short course, six weeks course with 10 Sudanese women uh, with different language uh, proficiency levels and uh, different skills and different backgrounds. We were three tutors. Two, two tutors and a language assistant. And we delivered, we designed, uh, we tried to design a course, uh, which was twice a week, um, to trying to teach the basics of the most useful things that people, foreigners in general, would need to learn in an English speaking country. Trying to use material that would be closer to foreigners rather than being uh, close to the actual standard. So the uh, the efforts to try and reach and, and build bridges was done, but it's not enough. Obviously, in six weeks course, you can you can just give a taster really, but you then understand how neat, how important it is to create to design more advanced material that uh, suits different uh, language skills, different needs and different uh, backgrounds. Because the problem is that usually what happens in these uh, ESO classes, ESO is a English for speaker of other languages. What happens in these classes is that learners from different countries and with different uh, of different languages, uh, first languages are put together. And they have different experiences. Uh, some of them have got some kind of knowledge of the, of the language. Some others speak a language that is similar to English or might have some similarities. Some other communities, some other people coming from certain countries do not have any, um, their languages don't have any uh, link or any similarities at all. So mm, you can find a class work with a classroom with, I don't know, 15 learners, uh, all of them put together in beginners, beginners level, but all of them with different languages. And obviously some of them struggle more than others uh, to learn or to assimilate the, the, you know, the grammar rules or trying to, you know, to, 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 to follow the lesson because sometimes it's even difficult to, you know, to catch the attention because the language, language barriers are immense sometimes, especially with people with low language skills. And a problem that I usually mention in 
in the school environment, but also outside this environment is that there is not enough material for people who uh, have a different alphabet, who use a different alphabet and try to learn English. So when they start from scratch, uh, uh, they just face the language using material that is designed for uh, people who actually use the, you know, the Roman letters, the Latin letters. So A, B, C, D. And that's a big problem. That's the main problem. That's the first barrier because many people, millions of people don't use the alphabet. So there is a huge need to start from scratch and create material that gets closer to the cultures of origin, to the languages of origin. So in order to do so, we need, there is a need of, you know, putting more brains together and create more useful material that gets closer to the learners. So it's more user-friendly material. I must add, on the other hand, that there are some resources that try to eliminate the barriers with a certain degree, very low degree of success, but I can see some efforts there, which is not enough. Like the, I, uh, I never stop mentioning the material that is free to download online, which is the Excellence Gateway, which is basically a range of resources from speaking, listening, writing, and reading that are designed for foreigners, for people coming from different countries. And they bring up topics that are of daily importance. So how to book a GP, how to uh, register a child uh, to school, how to uh, register for uh, a language class, or uh, how to book a train ticket, or how to do shopping. Uh, so usual, you know, day-to-day uh, -day needs that are brought into the uh, textbooks that are fully downloadable online and are free of charge. And you get also audio resources and loads of activities. And one important thing, one thing that struck my attention was that all the characters, all the people that were mentioned, portrayed in these uh, textbooks are not native English. Most of them are not. So there is a, you know, there is a step forward towards, you know, multicultural society by creating material that is not designed and meant for the majority, but for the minority. Obviously, it's not enough. Obviously, there's a lot to work on, but that could be a good example to step from and go ahead and create more suitable and specific material that gets closer to every single culture. I know it's an immense amount of work, because cultures around the world and languages around the world are thousands, thousands, if not more than that, hundreds of thousands. Uh, but uh, creating some specific ad hoc material that is more focused on the specific communities, that could help a lot, I think. And uh, trying to avoid, you know, uh, generalization and create material that is viable uh, and accessible just for uh, the lucky ones, which is still what ha what's, ha what's happening, especially in colleges, you get like uh, material that is designed for uh, foreign Europeans. And those are tend to be used for, uh, for, for asylum seekers and migrants. So you're like, okay, how do you teach them to write the alphabet when there's no hint or clue whatsoever on how to actually grab a pen and you know, write the letters in the right direction because the, the direction is already the first barrier because as we all know, there are you know, alphabets that go from left to right and other from right to left, up and down. So we, need, we literally need to start from scratch. So yeah, integration is something that will be uh, desirable but there is a lot to do. And I agree with both of you. There is integration, but to what extent? There's a limited extent, I must say. If you want to add any 
any comments i don't want to just take all the space but if you want to contribute on that on these points i think uh, Rome, uh romina is, is wanted to, to speak but i will i will speak after her to comment on one thing that you have just mentioned Romina, would you like? Yeah. Yes, sorry, I'm still trying to unmute myself. After such a long time, I still don't know how to do it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Can I just ask how you pronounce your name so that I don't mispronounce it? It's Fat. 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 Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> I I want to say I started learning Arabic just this year. I've I've had just a couple of uh of um lessons and I just so much related to what Vincenzo was saying because uh my previous the previous language i learned uh, i'm a bit of a linguist anthropologist obviously and so i've learned a lot of languages and uh, i've learned amharic which is spoken in ethiopia where my research is based and i've been based for the past two years uh and tigrinya and tigrinya happens well both of them really uh, come from gez which is a semitic language and i'm being taught uh, arabic by an ethiopian who is an Amharic speaker, but also is an Arabic speaker. And because I speak Tigrinya, which is a Semitic language, it's very much easier for me to relate to Arabic uh, because of some sounds and some of the, uh, the behaviors of the language. Uh, but it's still been very difficult to write from the other side <laughs> and, and really difficult to start reading the, the Arabic, right? It's just a very different writing. Um, and I've very much related to what Vincenzo, you were saying that it would be very helpful perhaps to have uh, the people who instruct to be at least from a um, kinship language. I don't know what the what the term would be to a closer language or the family language, the same family language of the one that you're teaching, uh, because I have found that uh, a bit a bit easier at least in, in you know in learning Arabic, which is such a challenge for me. Uh, but I just want to say I actually do uh, work. I lead a project uh, fat. Um, if I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Perfectly well. Mm. Um, and the project is actually, we're, we're, we're trying to, one, kind of decolonize the direction of knowledge from Ethiopia towards the UK uh, in order to understand how to respond to domestic violence in religious culturally sensitive ways. And the reason we're doing that is to be able to come back to the UK and work with uh, migrant and ethnic minority populations, not just from Ethiopia and Eritrea, but for, from the, you know, the whole of Africa and other destinations, uh, sorry, um, societies of origin, to be able to understand those barriers that Monica was talking about and you were referring to, um, for, at least for the part that I was able to listen to, and, and to see how we can actually um, sort of improve the integration of minority communities in the mainstream domestic violence services provision system that you also alluded to. And of course, we're, we're, we're focusing on the, on the religious element because the sector has been very secular, again, reflecting Western societies, particular particularly awkward relationship to religion, which is very much informed by secularism and so on. Um, but, but we're also looking at linguistic integration because without the language, you can't really move to religious sensitivity in a sense, just because you don't even have that bridge to, to discourse with someone and to try and understand their spiritual experience, right? And kind of put that into words and uh, create that trust in the session. Uh, where someone is seeking support um, to even for them to start telling you about the importance of faith in their life or or perhaps you know how they're coping and so on um, and i just i could so much relate to what you're saying based on what i've read and i've worked with migrant communities here in the uk as well uh, being based in churches with ethiopian and eritrean um, communities in particular and I and I I think what you were describing, I believe, for the Sudanese community, and I guess again, I'm sorry, I didn't hear from the beginning, uh, is very much relevant and sort of similar to what I was hearing in the in the churches. And I just I really appreciate your humility in saying that I really don't know how that integration could happen better or more efficiently because this is precisely what I'm hoping to look at with my team uh, this year. Um, and, and we're trying to work actually with, we're trying to do what we call community-led research where those mediators that you're talking about, such as yourself, who have built that trust, who are a bit influential, who are being respected and sort of, you know, um, followed by people, you've built that trust and it takes so, so much work. Um, to sort of be the ones who are helping us understand the community, not in an exploitative manner, but in a way that allows the community to feel that they own that research, the process, and they can really benefit from it uh, in terms of 
you know, being able to reach better to their own people and, and making sure that they get the support they need. So I would love to talk more with you afterwards. That's what I'm trying to say, uh, Fat. I think we have so much to say, but uh, but it's just such an honor to listen to you. And thank you so much for your humility. I think this is, you're, you're, you're sort of uh, hit the nail on the head <laughs> there with your, with your comment. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... I think research is a key word here. Um, and I think research among minority groups is, um, they don't really address the major basic issues and operational issues that would produce knowledge uh, that would help us uh, to, um, to, to move forward with this. I mean, just, just looking into what Ms. said about the, we need to create more uh, uh, adult materials that would uh, appeal to specific groups, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not too sure what kind of uh, uh, syllabus design research being done in the, in, in the past. This is something very obvious. If you, if you think this is not, this format of uh, ISOL is not working, change it, look into it, just think outside the box and, 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 and come up with something more in, innovative and, 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 and more appealing. Those guys will go to the ESOL courses and they go in the break and speak their own language with their colleagues who are participants in the same course. So they, they, are, they are not enjoying the knowledge. They are not actually, they, they are, they, they are in, in extreme discomfort, you, you might say. And they will just, one of the things that I advise them, and, and as Monica said, language is not only putting words together. Language is more than that. It's definitely beyond that. And I told them, I, you, you guys are very brave because you come to a country and you decide to live here and you are living here for a few years and you don't even listen to BBC. You don't uh, watch uh, English television. Even the football is watched from Arabic websites. And, and you don't read the papers. I feel very vulnerable if I don't know the political structure, if I don't know the uh, economic and, and the social uh, dynamics of the community that I live in. That is too brave for anybody to decide to immigrate to a country and you continue to know nothing about it, not alone the language. And then if you, if you just, if you make it like a habit, just switch on, say, channel uh, four at seven o'clock or 10 o'clock at BBC one, or and just listen to the news. You do nothing else. Just listen to the news. Your language uh, will improve and your knowledge of the country will definitely improve. And that will get you a little bit closer to the community where you chose to live in. And I think these are really simple things people don't really uh, highlight and stress upon. And I think it, it well, from personal experience, I, I, I'm not too sure whether if you have any experience working uh, in, in research within this community, it's not easy. Uh, I do my research mainly from health point of view and mostly sexual and infectious diseases point of view. And that is not easy to recruit uh, participants into any project that you do, unless you find someone like myself, people will know me uh, and they trust me. And when I invite them, please come, we have uh, just like interviews or focus group discussions, et cetera, et cetera. They would come. So I, I don't have problems recruiting but recruiting in general, especially if you are working here, isn't a straightforward process, I must warn you. Um, but obviously I'm quite I'm more than happy to, to continue communicating. I have massive amounts of friends from Ethiopia and Eritrea and I work with them also here. Um, and I have very, very close friends. And, and um, part of, I don't, I don't, work on, with the Sudanese community only, but I work with a lot of them and I see a lot of them in my clinics. And in, in, I have almost a dedicated clinic for 
non English speaking. Uh, I also uh, speak a few languages, being very lucky to <laughs> not only Arabic, I speak uh, Swahili and I speak uh, uh, Japanese. And uh, yeah, it, it's just uh, something that helps me in, and in sexual health, that is essential because um, the a couple of weeks ago, uh, a patient was booked into my clinic who's been spoken to by another doctor using a language line. Uh, and But then the, the dialect of, of the person who spoke to him is completely different from the one that he understands because he came from a country which is very challenging to understand the language of North African country. And it's just, I, I do understand all these dialects and I can speak, it's no problem with that. But if this person, he's extremely vulnerable, he needed to be seen, he needed to be treated, he needs to be helped, but he didn't understand a word, even using the language line. So the issues are very complicated and interacting with each other. And I think uh, the, the, we just need to be more innovative and to think really outside the box. We have a lot of information. We have a lot of experience. It's just about getting together and make things happen. And uh, what you have just mentioned, you are doing some work on domestic violence. And these are really very important issues. And um, I am aware of somebody who did, uh, who did work in Sudan uh, on domestic violence. And, and she faced a lot, of, a lot of issues and problems. But um, sorry, um, I'm quite happy uh, to, uh, if you could exchange some ideas with me and uh, see how we can get things sorted. Absolutely. Thank you, Fat. I, I would love to. Um, and I think um, th there's so much. We're trying to find a way essentially to capture all this lived experience that you and others have working with communities in sort of community based ways, whether through a clinic like yours or informally, even there are informal institutions in each community. And there's so much know how and experience there that we don't get to. Um, but but I I, I also found fascinating what you're saying about language. You know, yesterday I was at a, at a restaurant and someone, I speak Greek, I was raised in Greece and they spoke to me in Greek because they sort of understood I'm from Greece. And and I and they, they spoke in the same professional tone and the same way that they would speak in English. And I was a bit at all because we have learned to consider English more professional. And when we hear our own language, we think, oh, this is not professional enough. And there I learned the lesson. I said, you know what? I actually appreciate being spoken in Greek in the same professional tone, because this is teaching me that it's fine to be addressed in different languages in a professional context. And I need to consider each language as equally professional or as equally authoritative or whatever, or valid, whatever the term might be, um, even if it's not the, the, the standardized English or whatever I'm used to. And I think, I think it's exactly that. We need to sort of break, subvert this mentality that we all have. We've been sort of colonized into it to, to, to kind of uh, look down on our languages. And I, I've said this because I think I have it uh, internalized. I, I always, I'm very proud of my languages, but then I think it's subconscious. Um, and this relates to something that uh, we've come across a lot in terms of our review of the domestic violence sector. You see, the secular mainstream sector will always will tend to present itself as professional because they are a-cultural, they're not cultural, they're technocratic, and they'll, they'll pre present themselves as a-cultural, but and, and then they'll present the community-based organizations as cultural. <laughs> and and this is this is erroneous because of course it's cultural, it's it's a Western culture, it's a, it's you know, it's a certain mentality of what is valid approach to a problem and what is valid way of communicating with another in a professional context right so of course it's fundamentally cultural as well already um, and I just think it's, it's these kind of assumptions that we all have I think uh, the providers have the communities that seek support our we researchers have and we, we can start to break those assumptions together uh, as you are saying um, perhaps we can sort of learn to 
how can I say, start seeing the situation differently that allows us to open in our hearts to, to others. Because I think what, what is happening now is what, what I saw in Ethiopia uh, and what I see also in the UK, I think we start looking inwards and there is this, the way you see nationalism expanding in the, in the world, you see uh, communi communitarianism, I don't know what the term would be, everyone is keeping to their own communities. And it's this isol isolationist politics that I see or identity politics or call it whatever you want. And I'm just so tired of it because we don't fix problems like this. We, you know, we we need each other to 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 address problems because we all face them, uh, you know, in our respective communities. So I, I think this is such a big conversation that we can talk. You know, we, we really need to do something more and systematically about it. Absolutely, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know how to um, how to raise the hand, the electronic hand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm, I, can I talk again? Like, because I wanted to, <laughs> yeah, no, because you are our, our um, host here, basically. Um, I found what Romina said very interesting um, about the Greek, the experience at the restaurant, um, because when these things happen to me as well when somebody for example I speak Italian and German when they realize what my background is and then they speak in such a in either Italian or German it is absolutely correct that the the tone becomes more informal and I never really realized this but for me it actually is more of a place of comfort somehow. A lot of barriers are immediately broken down between the person I'm uh, speaking with the moment we, uh, in a different country, in, in, here in the UK, we then get to a common background. And I wonder whether there are some dynamics that are similar to what you have outlined, Fat. Um, so this was just one observation. Uh, this made me think. And I also have, I have a question also on something slightly different. Um, so I, I'll, if I can continue on that. So many years ago in India, I was teaching German. Um, and it was, there were courses that were directly aimed at spouses who wanted to join the, the the husband usually it's the wives who come second to uh, to Germany to migrate and I would like to know what you think about that because uh, if I'm not wrong this was also a, um, a legal requirement then for these spouses to obtain a visa so of course there was a lot of controversy around that but in a certain way it tackles some of the issues at the root and what we were doing was not only teaching the language, but we were also watching football together or organizing other cultural events like the, what is it called? The beer garden, which is so popular in Germany. We would have these types of uh, cultural get togethers as well. Um, so yeah, I would like to hear your opinions about that because that would probably be a different way of looking at it, but at the same time, it can um, add huge barriers when it comes to getting to um, to Germany in that case to a different country and I don't know whether there is such a thing also in the UK so yeah I would like to hear your your take on this and also Vincenzo since you also have been working so much uh, with these communities I would be very interested thank you um, well, in, in UK they have the same requirement uh, if you are bringing your spouse uh, she will have to be uh, subjected to um, a language uh, proficiency and uh, they will have their certain standard that she, she will need to achieve. And that's that's exactly the same the same scenario. And mostly uh, women coming after their husbands are settled here. Um, and, and apparently now they introduce also uh, life in UK as a as a prerequisite for obtaining uh, a British nationality. So you'll have to pass that test. 
uh, life in UK. And for me, whether that has an impact on anything, <laughs> I don't think it does. Uh, it's all about, I think it became a business and people will uh, teach you how to pass this test and, 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 and charge you some money for that. But um, I mean, life in UK, it, it, it's, it's a booklet, for example, you'll have to go through it and, and they learn very little about it. I think, I think the barrier is massive and, and people are not interested. It is for them is a survival. Uh, immigrants, when they come to this country, it's a matter of survival. They want it to stay and have uh, been given a home by the council and, and being granted visa to stay and then eventually indefinitely to remain, then a British nationality and a passport. And that is, that is the objective. That is the ultimate goal, which is something that we need to work very hard to change now. Because this, this is not a goal, because you've been granted, 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 but you haven't achieved anything yourself. You know, if somebody is giving you something, that is not an achievement whatsoever. And they uh, hold parties when they get residency, where they, get, they hold parties when they have, you know, they celebrate these things. Um, well, I think, I think it's, it's, it's a two-way system. We really need to work. We need to work with our communities a lot more than what we do now. If there is no problem. I mean, if you have to take an exam to go and join your spouse, that's fine. Do the exam, pay the money, do everything. But when you come here, what are you gonna do then? And and that is that is that is where the question is. And I think, I mean, people don't even vote <laughs> when I told them, well, this is you you having. You be, you you coming from countries oppressive regimes. You never had the joy of voting. Why don't you just practice this, experience this, make a choice based on whatever you wanted to? They don't vote. They, they their participation is so limited. And whether and of course I, you know you can always talk about conspiracy theories and, but uh, I think <clears throat> the responsibilities lies on people like us to get them out of this uh, trap really. If, uh, if I may add some comments to this. Yeah, I, well, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's very true, like the language, learning the language in many cases is just a matter of survival. The people learn the language so they can grant it a more uh, stable status in, the, in, in this country, in the UK. Uh, true, the learning how to pass the exam, life in the UK test is a booklet. There's some online forms that you can fill in and some quizzes that you can do on your own and you try and, and try and try them and then you learn the answers. That's absolutely true. Unfortunately, uh, it's also true that participation uh, can be a problem because, uh, well, uh, I guess, from my understanding, from what I can see, if there is no much input given to stimulate and engage with people, with foreign people, with people coming from other countries, then it's difficult to uh, establish some sort of contact. Uh, that is also true that I must say, I must say that uh, working for the council, I'm, you know, there are many things not working. Absolutely. There are many flaws, but at the same time, I can see from colleagues uh, some humanity, some, uh, you know, uh, willing to take action within the limits of bureaucracy. The problem here is also bureaucracy. There's a lot of paperwork. There are loads of forms to fill in. Uh, even for short courses, you have to fill papers, uh, you have to print copies, uh, you have to sign and cancel sign. And this is quite, you know, um, how can I say? Um, this is discouraging for people who just wish to come to class just to learn. 
and that's it. I mean, people, sometimes I hear comments like, I'm here to learn the language. I don't care about the rest. And this is absolutely true because if you don't make the mean, uh, the means of communication easy to access, uh, you create so many barriers, so many prerequisites because to take up a course in, uh, for the council, you have to be, to live in the UK for at least six months. If not, you're not allowed in some cases. But then there are nationalities and nationalities. Some nationalities are allowed to start earlier, some others are not. So bureaucracy plays a huge factor, even though among staff, among personnel, and I'm not speaking about myself because I'm, I'm new there in this environment, but I can see from established tutors who I'm working with, I can see the efforts and I can see the frustration as well because there's, there are loads of barriers that prevents them from teaching in a way that will get closer to the learner, truly. The problem is the system itself is so static and so uh, rigid in a way that if you don't fill a form, if you don't create your own material, your own portfolio, if you don't create your own range of proofs that demonstrate your language skills, that you cannot get a certificate. But at the end of the day, a certificate is important, is vital to access and to get a better job or better opportunities. But at the same time, that doesn't reflect 100% the, the true skills of a person. So the problem is, yes, like you said before, uh, yes, think outside the box, try and create some more engaging material. The problem is that many tutors are facing constantly the barriers of bureaucracy. And the barriers of bureaucracies a bureaucracy are encountered every day on a daily basis because you cannot, you have to stick within those two and a half hours, three hours slots, and you have to put as much information as possible because you have to deliver, because you have targets to achieve. Because as a tutor, you have to follow a scheme of learning, you have to achieve certain objectives, and you want learners to achieve them, but at the same time, you don't have enough time to develop them. So it's a, always a constant run against time because the structure itself is so rigid and so demanding that sometimes tutors do not forget, but they have to put on a side what the true needs are. So that's another constraint. I don't, I'm not defending from the side of the, the tutor what the problems are. Bridges are need, need to be built up. But the thing is the whole system needs to be rethought. There are exams that I appreciate and I think they're use, kind of useful. There are um, language exams that are called functional skills. Uh, for example, for language knowledge, for language skills that you get like um, speaking and listening activities that are not grammar based. So the gra grammar mistakes are not counted as such. So if you make a mistake as a learner, it doesn't matter as long as you deliver the message. And that is important, it's vital because in that way, you understand the effort that learner is making to learn and to deliver a message and communicate. So that's great. But obviously that's not enough, like I said, and to create new material, there is, like you said, a two -way, it's a two-way communication. So uh, tutors and educators need to get close to communities and people from the communities need to get close to tutors and need to establish a source of contact. And because these open schools, open learning centers that are free of charge uh, have spaces, but they're not developed enough. I think sometimes they're underused. Maybe the council could establish or could create some sessions, some dialogue sessions, some debating sessions to uh, talk to representatives of local communities and try to establish a contact in order to create better tailored made co um, core curricula, for instance. So I think that communication can be achieved if there is, there is the, if the means are created. And unfortunately also I must say that if something is not truly profitable uh, for the council, it cannot be developed. So even though there are loads of free courses, loads of them for different skills, IT and maths and all that, at the same time, uh, it, they, 
obviously the council receives money, receives funding from the wording bodies, from the government, because learners bring money. But no, let, let's be honest. At the same time, if these needs are, these financial needs are not met, then no extra uh, activities can be developed. So everything revolves around money, unfortunately. So that's my main point. So yeah, open to comments. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to uh, apologize uh, uh, because I, I needed to, I have another meeting in 20 minutes. <laughs> so I I will need to join uh, that meeting, uh, but it has been a massive massive pleasure um, listening to you and and talking to this conversation, and um, I would be more than pleased uh, to continue.